Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. And joining me for our third Philippines show is Ronnie de la Cruz. He is the director of the Bampan World War II Museum in central Luzon. He will talk about his work there at the museum and the Japanese war tunnels project. But before I bring Ronnie in, if you're watching this, maybe you've just found World War II TV. We had a, new, a few new visitors yesterday from the Philippines. Welcome to the channel. All the information you always need is in the description below. You'll find links to my guests' websites, their museums, their, their books, etc., etc. And you'll find more information about other World War II TV shows, our merchandise, and our Patreon and YouTube channel members. So that's the housekeeping done. I'm going to bring Ronnie in now. Good uh, afternoon where you are, Ronnie. How are you today? Well, I'm good. I'm, I'm fine. I accept the weather. Uh, we've been experiencing a lot of uh, monsoon rains, but everything is just fine here. I'm here now in my museum in Bamban, Luzon Islands. Brilliant. So before we, we, we bring up your PowerPoint, I wanted to ask you about you know, I'm from Normandy, where if you live in Normandy, you're completely aware of World War II. There are monuments everywhere. There are tanks, monuments. and st yep. In the Philippines, with a massive, great population, how how much is World War II in people's day-to-day -day life? Or is it kind of been forgotten by lots of people? Yeah, that's very sad. It's uh, kind of almost forgotten, you know. And uh, to tell you frankly, uh, in the whole Philippines, we have quite very few World War II museums, museums dedicated for World War II. But in fact, uh, every town and city in the whole Philippines had their own World War II heroes. Mm. But the sad fact is that that's being forgotten enough, even the history. And that's one main reason why I put my own museum dedicated to my father, uh, my grandfathers and my uncles and all those from my town who fought during the war. And it's a sad reality, you know, but uh, in my personal level, I have to do this. I have to preserve their memory, their legacy, preserve the history of World War II. Well, that's a great start then. It's a, it's a pity that more people aren't interested, but I think that's that's happening around the world. As the, as the war recedes into the past and there's less people around who remember it or even whose fathers or mothers remember it, it is going to be down to people like yourself at the museum, tour operators, museum. Uh, uh, YouTube channels and authors to get the history out there. But we'll bring up your PowerPoint. You're in charge of it today. We've got a lot of slides to get through, folks. At the end of we'll, we'll do questions at the end of the show today. Ronnie's going to take us through his presentation first. But if you have any comments to make, we'll yep. do them as we go along. But I'm going to hand over to Ronnie in a minute to take us through. So it's, a, it's a, a, a little bit about his museum and then particularly about the Japanese war tunnels and the other projects he's involved in. And, and um, I'm hoping yep. that all of you watching yep. will go yep. out and follow his... Um, his website and his Facebook page and, and see what he's doing. So over to you, Ronnie. Yeah, so uh, have a good day to you. Um, uh, Ronnie here from Bamban, Luzon Island, Philippines. Uh, I'll be talking about my museum and the activities that we're doing here. Yeah, that's me. Okay, uh, my museum is uh, the Bamban World War II Museum. It's a privately owned and operated uh, by me and my volunteers. It's uh, one of a uh, very few World War II museums in the Philippines. In fact, uh, there are no more than about five dedicated museums for World War II. And it's uh, a personal project to honor our local veterans. Well, in my family, I got six of them, three on my mother's side and three on my father's side. That's the, the image of my museum taken in the evening. Okay, and that's uh, the inside of the museum. Yes, uh, uh, here in this gallery, you can see uh, our local veterans. Some of them fought in the battlefields of Bataan and Corridor. Some of them were Makhatar's guerrillas, civilians who heeded the call for resistance against the Japanese during the time. And our Aitane Gritos. And another purpose of my museum is to preserve and promote World War II history. And you know, uh, this, this kind of history is actually a personal one because we're really connected with it. You know, mm. uh, our members of the families fought, um, as I have been telling, um, in the Philippines, most of the towns and cities during the war, they had their own families who joined the war. Some of them fought as a regular army in the battlefields of Bataan. 
you know, in corridor. Uh, they went through the, the fighting. Uh, some of them were in the death march, uh, imprisoned at the Camp O'Donnell. And there were some who were civilians who, who became guerrillas. The Aetania Gritos. Yep. So this is the kind of museum that you could see all of this. And you can see here we were also very much active in uh, going through the battlefields, the former battlefields, and collecting stuff like this in this photograph. Uh, you could see the uh, the M2 Madus and, uh, and uh, a Japanese Hawk 5 recovered from the former battlefields and the airfields that was used by the Japanese. Yeah, and uh, here also uh, you could find different perspective of the war. And of course, most importantly, the Filipino perspective. I've been uh, documenting our local veterans since early 2000 when I established my organization, the Bamba Historical Society. And about following years, I did the uh, establishment of the Bamban World War II Museum. And uh, it's also important to highlight the role of our item and Gritos uh, during the war. It's a, actually it's a forgotten role of our indigenous people in the fight against foreign invaders at that time. And also, of course, perspective of the Americans. Uh, you could find a lot of these forgotten American soldiers who were here during the war. Some of them were killed, you know, uh, just like in this photo. That's uh, Major Havelak Nelson of the 194th Tank Battalion. You know, uh, he died here in the mountains of Bamban. He escaped, uh, you know, at the Camp O'Donnell when he was uh, on a firing squad and. Uh, Fortunately and miraculously, uh, so uh, he was able to crawl out of that uh, uh, mass grave, and uh, he was helped by the Filipinos to lead a guerrilla. But finally, he died because of the wounds. So there are a lot of these Americans who were here during the war, probably forgotten. But here in my museum, you know, we kept their legacy alive, and we have also the the side of the Japanese or part of the World War II history here. As you can see in this uh, uh, image, uh, uh, we have a lot of Japanese visitors also, you know. So, yes, uh, okay, welcome to my Bamban World War II Museum. And I would like to share the historical perspective of this museum. It's, uh, why Bamban? In the first place, it's a, a strategic location, you know, anchor on the north side of Clark Field and overlooking the two main uh, 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 road network. One is the vehicular, one is the railroad. That was very important. You could see in this image taken in 1945, February, uh, behind the town are those Bamban Hills where they were became an important military basement, not only in World War II, but during the Philippine American War. You know, Bamban also became an important battlefield and uh, our Filipino defenders, led by General Aguinaldo, uh, they took positions in Bamban, while General Arthur MacArthur, Douglas uh, MacArthur's father, was here and fought our defenders. So because of the strategic place, the high ground overlooking the major highway and the uh, uh, train station, uh, railway, and it is the gateway to Clark Field. Uh, you can see in this map, Bamban is anchored to the north where the, the main highway leading to Manila. And it was also uh, an important factor that uh, a lot of these airfields were constructed at Clark Field and including the Bamban airfield to the north where these mountains provided, you know, a strategic emplacement and uh, here is a photograph of the 40th Division fighting in the hills of Bamban. You know? Okay, so you can see in this photograph, this is a photograph of our Liberation Day. Uh, there is a boundary sign that says Bamban, and at the bottom is a Japanese, uh, I think it's a Katakana. Yeah, and these were the first uh, American soldiers from the 40th Division, and they were accompanied by Filipinos. Well, Bamban is just a, a few minutes away from Clarkfield, and that's another important thing. And Clarkfield, you know, was a major American airfields 
even before the war. As you can see in this image, that this is a photograph here was taken sometime in 1924. I think this is the Haviland uh, D4H, and that's the, the, the original Crockfield hangar. And it was uh, occupied and used by the Japanese Army and Navy Air Services uh, after the occupation of this uh, place and the Battle of uh, uh, Bamban Bridge. And you can see here, uh, it's a massive, really massive uh, aerodrome center in central Luzon. You could see to the almost to the, to the center that's uh, Fort Sattenberg, and to the right, these are the many airfields, something like 13 airstrips constructed by the Japanese. And of course, uh, the Clark Air Center. So the Japanese they expanded the original Clark Field into uh, uh, satellite airfields from the towns uh, in the towns of Bamban, Mabalaka, Angeles, Fora, and the inside the Clark proper. So you can see here the Sambales Mountains behind the back, you know, and the, 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 the massive uh, airfields to the, to the direction of the east. And that's uh, the, the Sambales Mountain Rings. These were very important, you know, basement for the guerrillas overlooking all of these airfields. That's why it's, it was very important that, uh, you know, the guerrilla resistance movement that was started by Major uh, Lieutenant Colonel Cloud A. Torp from the battlefields of Bataan, he moved here behind Clark Field because that was a very important mission to gather intelligence. And he was staying above the grounds overlooking these airfields. And of course, the Japanese, uh, uh, they, they, they completely developed these areas Part of central Luzon as the Clark Air Center, where the, the first air fleet of the Imperial Japanese Navy and the Fourth Air Army established numerous airfields and used them uh, in, 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 in a battle in, in Leyte and on the operation against the Americans in Mindoro and in, in Lingayen. And also from these airfields, organized the Kamikaze Special Attack Forces. Of course, who would forget the guerrillas? You know, these brave men who went behind Japanese lines to organize the resistance from these hills in Bamban and above Clark Field. You can see in this photograph that's uh, Captain Bruce being interviewed by an officer of the 40th division and on his side were uh, are actually naval aviators shut down and became part of the guerrilla movement and on the right side these are the american guerrilla officers who were tasked to organize and continue the fighting behind japanese lines and this is very important also, the forgotten role of our indigenous people here in, in the region, the Ayata Negrito Squadron 30 under Captain Bruce. And on the other side, that's the Negrito Squadron 155. And you could see in the center, that's Kujaro, Colonel Kujaro. You know, this, this guy is very amazing personality. You know, he was a, one of the very few, probably the only indigenous people, Ayatana Grito, who was fully recognized by the United States Air Force. And when he died in 1970, he was given full honors and he's buried at the American Cemetery here at Clarkfield. Mm. And the other unit, the Sawang Mountain Patrol, these were located in the mountains of Sawang in Sambales Mountain. It's, uh, you know, uh, literally the the mountains or the Sambales Mountains behind Crockford were actually, uh, uh, these were mountain routes where the indigenous people could travel on the mountain trails going to some to the provinces of Tarlac, to Pampanga and Sambales all up operating under the umbrella 
of the Luzon guerrilla forces. And they were very, very instrumental for the resistance to survive, continue, because as I am telling, the American guerrilla leaders, Lieutenant Colonel Cloud A. Thorpe, established the, the guerrilla resistance in their ancestral domain because mm. the Japanese were looking for them. They, they put a huge amount of money in their head. And the only way they could survive is to go into this Aetane Guito ancestral land. And from there on, they established numerous use of a guerrilla units in every town and cities across the plains of central Luzon and expanded in the other you know areas and you, you you could tell that most of the american guerrilla leaders actually came or passed along the headquarters of colonel thorpe behind clark field and part of the world war ii history here is the uh you know the founding or the establishment of the japanese kamikaze special attack forces okay uh in the town of mabalaka when admiral onishi you know visited the the officers of the 201st kokotai or the air group and organized the first kamikaze special attack forces and in, in this photograph uh that's the the first uh successful sorties of the naval kamikaze at Mabalakat East Airfield. And to the right side of the photograph is Admiral Onisi and staff. Of course, there is also another kamikaze, the Army kamikaze. And you can see here that's in Margot Airfields. You know, Japanese are looking for their sortie. And to the other side, that's uh, uh, that's the, uh, the Japanese... Uh, commanding general of the Port Air Army, General Tominaga, giving final instructions to the Japanese kamikaze. Now, let's go to the air war and the destruction of Clark Field. It was on September 21 when the naval, uh, uh, the American naval uh, forces began massive uh, aerial bombardments of Japanese facilities in Luzon. And from there on, it, it continued until uh, uh, the the battle for Leyte Gulf. And you could see here in this photograph taken on November 5, you know, that's Fort Satzenberg, the lower left. And to the, to the right, that's, that's a lily hill being attacked by the, the groomers of the USS Wasp. It was almost on a daily basis when the... The, the, the massive uh, uh, U.S. Navy's Air Forces uh, began conducting, you know, aerial operations in the Clark Air Center. And this is another, the photographs uh, of the Bomber Airfield being under attack by the U.S. Uh, 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 bombers from the USS Wasp. And here is another photograph from the nearby Mabalakat Airfields. You know, again, you could you could find all of these uh, online at the National Archives. Mm. Um, a lot of these documents are now available, including photographs. And it's, you know, it's amazing uh, uh, source of uh, documents, primary sources. And, you know, these kind of photographs, you could see the East Airfield under attack by the airplanes from the USS Wasp. And here's another one. And you can see here, uh, Stuttenberg, Fort Stuttenberg to the right. And the, uh, there is a, a massive aerial bombardment of the Lily Hill. I think this is uh, uh, the Japanese airstrip number two. And uh, beside Lily Hill here is actually the airstrip number three. So, but this one was not uh, conducted by the Navy, but by the the Army Air Forces, the 494th Bomb Group. It was the same uh, bomb group that uh, bombarded Bomban. And at, at that time, uh, these were the, the B-24Js, the heavies, you know, uh, who conducted a lot of these uh, air operations against Japanese facilities. And this is uh, another one. I think this was, uh, it was an, uh, an a major, one of the major um, air operations conducted by the light 
uh, light bombers, uh, the A-20s, the B-25s, you know. It was on January 7 when they came from Tacloban and some of them are from Mindoro and conducted uh, one of the largest uh, uh, air operation in the Southwest Pacific on January 7. Uh, the 312 bomb group also were here and the air Apaches, you know, and you could see here the, the mountains behind Clark. These are the Bonbon Hills and the airfields under attack. I think uh, the hangar below, this is the original hangar of the Clark field. Right. And just to interrupt you for a second, Ronnie, because and yeah, by the way, this sure. is fantastic. Is is what you're saying is is I'm thinking of what John McManus said on last night's show is that so many people, when they think about this part of the war, they think about the naval battles, the carriers engaging carriers and the the, the cruisers and the destroyers. And and McManus made the point that the the fighting on on the ground in the Philippines is an incredibly vast and complicated and and decisive campaign, and yet it seems to get overlooked. I mean, you made the point about the Jap the thirteen Japanese airstrips around Clark Field. You made the point about the Army Air Corps bombing it, the importance of the guerrilla and the resistance networks. Yeah, are you frustrated when you read general books that when they talk about the Philippines, it's always about the naval battle? It's always about what's happening hundreds of miles off your shores. And you do you feel that the Philippines campaign is is overlooked somewhat? Well, uh, in some ways, yes. But you know, the, the the period in history here, yes, the the navy. It was the navy's war at the beginning. Yeah. In in uh, uh, October 1944. However, this is my presentation. The slide: the battle for Clark Field and Bowman Hills, and this goes with the army, with the, with the yeah. land battle. Yeah. So, yeah, um, uh, th this is the kind of uh, 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 part of that World War II history that should be also um, uh, promote being to, to promote. You know and this is actually uh, my museum's uh, main, uh, you know, exhibits, the 40th yeah. Division, the 43rd, the 38th. And all of these uh, divisions fought under the 6th Army and the 8th Army. And so, in fact, as we go along, I could show you um, one distinct image that will be, you know, uh, uh, an important part of World War II history. But, so, by the way, yeah, uh, yeah. as you can see in this map, okay, Ban Ban anchored to the north of Clarkfield, and that's the area of the 40th Division on January 23, 1945. And uh, uh, the 40th, they came along the National Highway and the Railway, and uh, they were tasked to clear the Japanese Kembu Group, or the Kembu Sudan, in Ban Ban Hills, while the 37th Division, coming from the east, would strike Clark Field. And from January 28th up to the end of January was the fighting on Stutzenberg and Clark Field, while the 40th, they stayed for more than a month because they have to clear the main Japanese forces of Clark Field, the Campbell Group. And the Campbell Group were anchored on a vast mountainous areas overlooking Clark Field. Their mission was to prevent the Americans from utilizing the airfields. And from their location on the high ground, they established and constructed more than a thousand tunnels. And the machine guns and automatic cannons from the wreck aircraft, they, they moved these to the mountain positions that uh, eventually the US Army would call the most extensive tunnel defense system ever fought in the Pacific outside of Okinawa. And this is also you know, a forgotten uh, episode of World War II, the, the, the tunnel warfare, you know. Okay, uh, here, uh, General MacArthur was here on January 26, 1945. You could see here, he was in Camp O'Donnell uh, visiting the, the, the former concentration camp. And I think that is the, the White Cross that was erected by the American prisoner of war. And in the center, he visited General Rob Brass of the 40th Division in Bamban Front. And from there, he moved to Clarkfield, where he saw the, the, the heavy artillery barrage on Japanese positions inside 
crop field. And, you know, the Japanese, they, they fully uh, utilize the higher ground and the rough terrain and con constructing numerous tunnels in every ridge and in every hill that to the American infantry, it was a minor campaign in every hill. And, you know, that's a very important part of the history. And the Japanese were really fanatical to stand on the grounds and they would rather die inside these tunnels. There were some, you know, uh, historical accounts of uh, suicide when the American uh, army uh, were clearing all of these tunnels and they, they would just rather put some petrol, drums of petrol and burn them literally. Wow. And here's a typical of the uh, Japanese tunnels in Bamban Hills. You could see this, uh, <laughs> a small hill uh, and the road network covering the whole slope of the hill. And you could see the numerous tunnels Mark on the side of this hill. We've been here. Uh, we, we, we dug up two tunnels and we, we found some you know, remains and, uh, you know, uh, lots of artifacts in this uh, hill. We identify every hill here in Bonbon Hills. And this is another uh, a Japanese uh, tunnel defense position. This is just near the museum. It's the south of the museum, something like a a uh, uh, two kilometers distance and you, you could see in one one of the face of the hill you could count something like uh, one two three four five six seven eight nine nine interconnected japanese tunnels on the high ground and literally the american soldiers had difficulty in trying to flush these japanese defenders holding this tunnel that they devised a certain strategy on how to defeat the defenses and in the destruction of the Campbell Group, this is one perfect image that says it all. I was in a national conference, international conference on World War II history, and one of the audience asked me, if really Bonbon Hills was so important in World War II, why it's not written? Why, why uh, mm. we don't know anything about it? And I showed them this one single photograph, you know. Three soldiers from the 185 Infantry 40th Division raised the flag. They just improvised because they don't have a flagpole. And you could see the bayonets fixed. Yeah. While one guy is watching over them. Well, in fact, this says it all. You, you cannot just raise the flag for nothing. You know, it's Iwo Jima. Just actually almost on the same day with Iwo Jima, it was only overshadowed by the Iwo Jima flag raising. Mm. Iwo Jima was on February 23 and you know, the, the, the famous uh, Joe Rosendahl photograph while the 40th Division was on February 25. You know, this was taken on the summit of Hill 1700. And we did uh, went that summit in 2000 to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. I was with uh, an American, former American Air Force man, uh, Gene Irene, uh, with some of the I-10 Gritos. They are also descendant of World War II veterans like me. Right. And it was a very solemn ceremony, a simple ceremony. We went there and we raised the flag on the exact day and time, 1020 in the, in the morning, we raised the flag and we remember those who died and those who fought. So yeah, that's it. That's the World War II history that you could find here in my Bamban World War II Museum. And this is the you know, the front of my museum. Okay. So we have the galleries here. This is my main gallery. Uh, a lot of these artifacts were recovered from the former battlefields and a lot of forgotten American heroes, you know, that we, we deeply honor, especially these officers and enlisted personnel were killed here, you know, fighting for the freedom that we were enjoying. Yeah. And our grandfathers and uncles fought with them. That's what I'm very proud of. And it's an honor to erect this, uh, establish this uh, World War II Museum in their memory. Here's uh, the gallery, a 
of our World War II heroes from this town. Uh, the center is my grandfather, actually. <laughs> right, brilliant. My grandfather. And beside my grandfather here is, is uh, my uncle Domingo. Okay, and some of these are actually Aitan Negritos. So, you know, this is a so sad situation in the Philippines that this is World War II history. We are personally connected, and yet you cannot find that many of this kind of museum. And I'm very humbled to say that here in Bamban, we care. We care about the role of our grandfathers and uncles who fought during the war. In Bamban, there are more than 500 you know, Filipino soldiers and guerrillas who fought during the war. And you could see here in my museum, it's, it's not only the name, but the picture yeah. that speaks a thousand words. But the, the, and, the, fasc the fascinating thing, though, Ronnie, is that you know, I've had guests from 35 different countries or something, is that every country that was affected by World War II has been on a separate journey since that war, depending on the effects, how it views that war. You know, I live in France. France for, has been through all sorts of waves of, of interest, denial. Everybody was in the resistance. Nobody was in the resistance. resistance. Think countries like Romania. You know, but, the, but the Philippines getting its full independence in 1946, lots of other things yeah. happened. There are other wars in, in Asia. You know, just yeah. because there's not interest in World War II right now doesn't mean there won't be in 10 years' time. It doesn't mean that things won't change. Countries oh, yeah. are discovering their past at different yeah. times. That's one of the yeah. fascinating right. things is that, you know, right. it's uh, um, it, it's down to That's people true. like yourself and the, these, uh, and the volunteers you have with you to, to share these stories. And, and the interest will come because how can you take World War II out of the Philippines story? The Philippines, it it... it, it it was incredibly costly for you as a country, but it was also incredibly important for your establishing yourself as a as a as a presence, as a as as self destiny. You know, you you you. Right. We were talking with John McManus last night about how often the Philippines are seen as like victims, or they're seen as acting as secondary to the USA. They're your equal partners with the USA. Without without the the Filipino guerrillas, the American uh, right. couldn't, have, couldn't have fought there. You know, it was. The dominance of the Filipino activity is something we need to hear more about. You weren't playing as second partners to the Americans. You were equal there. You were liberated. It was your knowledge yeah. of the terrain. So, um, but yeah, fantastic. People loving it, by the way. So, so back to you. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, here in my museum, we we give uh, importance to every guest. Uh, we provided a museum tour. We discuss. Aside from these, uh, you know, images and artifacts, we also discuss uh, in giving uh, uh, educational uh, um, narratives, historical narratives about the war. And, you know, uh, the role of the Filipino guerrillas, you know, uh, I keep telling my visitors that uh, the eventual uh, uh, decision for MacArthur to fulfill the I shall return somehow is also related to the existence of the, the more than 200,000 Filipino guerrillas ready to fight and die. Yeah. And that's very important. And I'm very proud that among those guerrillas and soldiers were my grandfather and my uncles. You should be proud. And, well done. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is a one way of uh, saying to the world, hey, we're very proud of our uncles and our grandfathers. Come to Bamban Museum, see how we respect and honor. And by doing this, we would like to uh, convince and influence other towns and cities to put their own World War II Museum to, to research and look for their families who, who was part of World War II history, right? Yeah. And to put a museum like this that will inspire the present and the future generations. So here, here are our visitors actually I think this is a Japanese visitors looking at my grandfather. <laughs> and in one of uh, the galleries inside, I mean, uh, uh, at the back is the, the, the air war or the air campaign, where you could see some Japanese naval ace pilots and the American naval ace pilots who fought above the sky of uh, Bauman and Clarkville. Now you can see me there. And these are Americans. Uh, I, I'm giving 
uh, you know, a lecture about the history that happened here behind me is the flag raising. And in front is a gallery for the, the air war. And not just the adults, but also the kids, of course, because, you know, these kids unknown to them, they have great grandfathers, great uncles in their families who also fought during the war. And I think we are on the right track to say that somehow our objective is becoming into Prussian because of what we're doing in our museum. And here, uh, there are also some media personalities who come here, uh, uh, Americans, uh, Japanese, uh, Koreans recently. Now even the bloggers come here. So mm -hmm. here's uh, another gallery, the second Lieutenant James Hart Memorial Library. I name it in honor of second Lieutenant James Hart, who was part of the 194th Tank Battalion and who led the organization of the first guerrilla unit in Bamban, but somehow he was killed in a Japanese raid in September of 1943. My grandfather and my uncles fought with James Hart, and our elders had a, a high respect to this man, you know, and so to honor him, I named this as a Lieutenant Hart Memorial Library. So, yes, uh, we have a lot of activities project and programs, although we're, we're, we are, you know, a, a private organization, but uh, we are the the group of World War II descendants that we have this uh, walk the talk, you know. And so uh, part of our activities is searching for the forgotten heroes, our World War II heroes project. It's a one way of uh, connecting with fellow descendants of World War II veterans, not only Filipinos, but even the indigenous people. And I am very happy to tell that uh, in the near future, I will be publishing a book about our local veterans who fought during the war, Filipinos and the Ayatane Gritos. And you can see here families of uh, World War II veterans visiting Bamban Museum and, you know, we we make an interaction with them to allow us uh, to have the military records, photographs, and any manuscripts that would add to the collection of the World War II Heroes Project that we present here in our museum and in the near future publish their book so that they will never be forgotten. Aside from the museum, they have the book and this will be the uh, veterans from this small town in the Philippines. Um, of course, we have another activities here, uh, the operation of fireflies. You know, um, Bamban Hills was one of the most extensive tunnel defense system fought in the Pacific and the Japanese constructed more than a thousand tunnels. And many of these tunnels were closed by the US Army during the, the ground operation. And so in these tunnels, there is a high probability of remains of the Japanese war that is still inside. So I was I was born here. I, I, I grew up here. I have my friends here, you know, my, my classmates, and we have we're we're um, all World War II descendants. So it's our passion to go to the battlefields. And we studied every single hill and we have photographs that you could see just like in the center those are japanese tunnels sealed by the u.s army right and right now there are only two tunnels open so we were able to trace the other closed tunnel and we plan to open these sealed tunnels in the near future you know probably artifacts, even remains of soldiers still inside, you could find it. This is our Operation Fireflies. Just like here, in, in, in this is, this this uh, photograph to my left is, uh, to the left is the operation when we collected remains of Japanese Navy soldiers 
in hill 1700 on the same hill where the, where the American flag was raised. And this is another uh, uh, sets of remains, a Bamban Museum taken inside the tunnel, a Japanese Navy tunnel. So, you know, uh, it's one of our passion to, to check all of these um, Japanese war tunnels. And uh, we bring our metal detectors and our gear, we organize, you know, and see what's left inside. Sometimes we could just see a small hole and uh, open it and checking what's inside. So we call this the Project Discovery World War II Tunnels. As you can see here in this set of photographs, so from the left, that's a slope of a, of a ridge, okay? And this is my team. And uh, yeah, we have here one American guy Gerald Randy Anderson Sr. with us. And in the middle of these uh, photographs, you could see we're, we're starting to dig on our target tunnel. And to the right, you could see we were able to open the tunnel. So to think there, there are numerous of these sealed tunnels. And out of this discovering the tunnels, we, we collect artifacts. We actually conduct a survey and mapping of these tunnels and put them in a database. Uh, it's, it's our goal in the future that we will publish a book about this. Mm -hmm. So here's another photograph. So just a recently opened tunnel here to my left. And to my right, we're discovering another tunnel here. And Paul, these tunnels are just a kilometer away from Bamban Museum. Wow. <laughs> yeah, they're very accessible. Look at the potential of these tunnels aside from, you know, World War II history. You could have tourism. You could have education. You know, uh, our grandfathers fought on these hills along with the U.S. Army divisions, the 40th, the 43rd, and the 38th. And you can see me here, we're, we're conducting mapping inside of these just recently open tunnels. And at some point here on, 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 on the photograph to the right, you could see me. Uh, and uh, my company here, Tim, Tim Beckinsall, an Australian archaeologist. Yeah, uh, we found some artifacts inside. And we're documenting this. You know, you could, you could find this in my YouTube channel also. So there's a lot of adventure. And out of the mapping, we prefer a map similar to like this. Okay. And uh, hopefully, uh, as, as we go along in years, we could uh, uh, make a, a database, a complete database, and uh, yeah, uh, produce a book about what we're doing, our adventure on the Discovery War Tunnels. Mm -hmm. And just and to say, folks, I have put that. links to some of uh, Ronnie's films are in the description below. I think I've, I've put three of the films that Ronnie takes groups in there. They're in the description there. So when you finish watching this, folks, go off, watch Ronnie's channel, and you can get more information. Yeah. While, while, I've, while I've interrupted you, we've got a couple of questions about the tunnel. So the first one is from Ian Carr. Was Filipino forced labor used to excavate the tunnels back in World War II? Yes. Yeah, that's right. Actually, um, I did a lot of uh, research about the uh, the Japanese uh, uh, personnel, officers, and the use of Koreans, Taiwanese, Chinese, and Filipino forced labor. In fact, uh, I was in Japan in 2000 and 2001. I worked there. And while I was there, I took the time to do an extensive research. Um, uh, gathering uh, manuscripts and books. And I even met a lot of the former soldiers who were here during the war. And from these documents, uh, I found out that uh, the, the Japanese had a record of these, uh, you know, labor personnel, as they called wow. the Setsuetai and the Setetai. Setsuetai, I think it's the Navy and the Setetai, the Army, something like that. And yes, uh, based on the records, there were something like 1,200 Filipino forced laborers or, or to dig these tunnels. And something like a Taiwanese, they have uh, 600 of them. 
uh, uh, these were just uh, plain civilians taken uh, from the towns and cities in, in Formosa and brought here to work with the Japanese army just to dig tunnels. And so goes with the, the Koreans and the Chinese also, yeah. probably almost the same numbers, and they were under Japanese officers in the Setetai and the Setsuatai unit. Um, uh, uh, um, there were uh, distinctively units, pioneers, just like 318 pioneers, 322 pioneers, like that. Uh, yeah, I did I did an extensive research, and uh, hopefully I will publish the book uh, in the future. So yes, the answer is yes. There were Filipino forced laborers who did the diggings of these tunnels. A, a very detailed answer. Thank you very much, Ronnie. So, so back to you. Yeah, so aside from the searching for the closed tunnels, we also search for the open tunnels, uh, uh, do mapping of them. Um, you know, I, I'm very much afraid that uh, as the time pass without documenting this part of World War II history, these will be just closed again by erosion or probably by human activity. You know that that's why it, that's why it, it's very important to have a database of this, and this is one of our activities also, the World War II battlefield history study. So in this case, uh, uh, this was taken in 2020. I think it was it was at then at the height of the pandemic, and we decided to go and you know survey these tunnels, and the tunnel was located at the former Babalakat West Airfield, which is inside Clark. Field preport zone. You know, very, very few Filipinos dare to go in these tunnels. <laughs> the reason is that they're afraid that there are some snakes, of course, poisonous snakes, the Philippine cobra, or probably bombs or mines. But, you know, uh, we're the kind of guys that uh, we really love going in these tunnels. Of course, we were taking up safety precautions, and you could see. My team here, you know, at the entrance of Inagaki Tunnel. And this is just located inside the Freeport zone. And believe me, it, it's such a big tunnel. It has about four laterals, you know. Um, it goes more than 500 feet inside. Very big. Wow. And it's near, the. Uh, I mean, it's inside the Clark report zone where you could find the former American Air Force Base and which is now converted into Clark International Airport and a lot of tourists come here and you could see the potential of these tunnels so we map this every inch of the inside of the tunnel and fully documented it uh, yeah I, I, I'm gonna make a YouTube uh, video for this we had a an extensive uh, uh, videos shots of the inside of this tunnel. It's very fascinating tunnel. Lots of history here. Of course, uh, we do research, we document, and we 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 do some publications online. My uh, investigating history series, and you could see me here. We're in the in the former battlefields. You could see a lot of these bullets is still in bed on the wall. Yep. So you know. We're the kind of guys in a museum that don't just sit down here and talk to visitors. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but really, it, it's a, a, a fascinating adventure for the love of learning World War II history. Now, while you're having a sip of water, we've got another couple of questions for you. So the first, I, I think I know the answer to this, is, but um, Rick Green is saying, is this strictly a private initiative or do you get any support from academia or the government? It's private. I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we we do not receive any support from our government. Uh, we have friends, you know, just like Gerard Randy Anderson. Uh, sometimes when we have our activity on on the Project Discovery War Tunnel, he would support us. You know, uh, fund our uh, uh, our um, project on a specific tunnels like that. Yeah, we just rely on the help of our friends who, who have the same passion as uh, with us. And it's so seldom here in the Philippines for a group like this, really dedicated in this kind of task, you know. Yeah, well, hopefully uh, there's also a lot of battlefields out, former battlefields out there. And hopefully um, you're also 
persons or group of persons, descendants of World War II veterans, to do their own things like this in their own town and cities. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's really private. Yes, Paul. No, 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 back to you. Sorry, I was. I thought you were going to say something. Okay, okay. So here is another photograph. Uh, Tim Beckinsale, uh, okay, he's not an Australian archaeologist, is looking into another uh, a bullet that still appears on the wall of the uh, uh, ridge line where it was a, a battlefield during World War II. And this is just uh, less than a kilometer from my museum. And on the right side, we, we go to the former battlefields here in this photograph. Uh, I was with the Jean Iring, and this is what I'm telling about the flag raising on the summit of Hill 1700 yeah. when we did the, the reenactment in our own small way of honoring the American soldiers with their Filipino, uh, you know, uh, buddies during the war uh, on the 75th anniversary of the flag raising in Bamban Hills. So we do search every battlefields and whatever we could find relics or you know uh, vestiges of world war ii and sometimes oh, we, we happen to see other stuff you know just like this uh it's a an old stottenberg uh, 1908 concrete post hmm. when they enlarge stottenberg uh, uh, uh into a military reservation there so they put a lot of these uh posts and we documented some of them. And of course, uh, who could forget our battlefield tours, World War II battlefield tours? Well, this is a, a very, very interesting uh, tours. It's a kind of a unique, you know. Um, we, we have a, a World War II tours and um, to, to highlight this part of World War II history from this small town. And we started it way back in 2018. And from there on, still continue even to these days. And this is our recent one. This, uh, I think that was just uh, last month. And we have the, the uh, uh, military instructors and cadets from the West Point Academy. So from the museum, OK, we, we will give briefing. And we have an itinerary of several of the tunnels big tunnels some of them used for you know shelter some of them for uh, depot some of them headquarters and you could see me here in this photograph discussing uh, inside one of the biggest tunnels with the west point instructors so there you go a lot of these uh, you know groups uh, that uh, participated in our battlefield tours you know, so, some of the tunnels are so big that you could put vehicles inside. And these tunnels that are near the museum, these, most of them were constructed for a very specific purpose, and that is logistics. Mm. Because they're near the highway. In fact, the Japanese Army and Navy Air Services, they, they put aircraft spare parts into these tunnels because the Americans were bombarding, you know, Clark Field and the satellite airfields in the central plane. So uh, uh, to avoid being destroyed, so they, they, they decided to convert these tunnels, make them big as their logistical supply depot. That's why uh, they are constructed on a very specific purpose. So here, here's one of our materials for our World War II tours. You can see the museum is number one. And you know, uh, we have an itinerary. Um, you could go to the number two. These are, there are two big tunnels here and number three. And in the vicinity, you could find a lot of tunnels and we keep on searching for the closed tunnels. And recently we, we, we found three of them and we have another two suspected closed tunnels that we would like to open soon. Wow. Yeah, but right now, you know, the, the weather is so bad. Uh, we've been experiencing almost two weeks of continuous monsoon rains. So probably when the weather improves, so we will 
uh, go back again to the former battlefields and do the, uh, the adventure. Operation Homecoming is a very fascinating activity. Uh, we connected with uh, some of the Americans who were here way back in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. These are the guys at that time roamed the hills of Bam Bam, gathered artifacts for a passion, brought them to the United States, and some of them were left here. And now uh, we're trying to reconnect with them and, and bring those artifacts into our museum. Isn't that cool? Wow. And we're, we're really grateful that these guys were able to, you know, uh, preserve what they had collected from the former battlefields of Bonbon. And now they're, you know, coming back to our museum. So that's uh, my friend Dahl. And Mike Ward also. That's a Nambu pistol. And these are his collections now in a permanent exhibit at Bonbon Museum. So we we continue to you know to to connect with these people and some other guys uh, who have artifacts that uh, if they wanted to bring them back here you know so we could put them in a permanent exhibit and this is the collaboration program with the japanese government operation fireflies where we you know uh, handed over some of the remains we gathered from the tunnels okay uh these were the representatives and officials from the ministry of labor health and welfare when we handed over some of the remains and also um we're getting in touch with the with the dpaa on their search for the uh, uh missing in action just like this uh the, the crew of the b25 that crashed in angeles from the 500 bomb squadron the, the air apaches so uh, uh, we had a meeting here. They they show us uh, and lecture us about what they are searching for, and we would like to help them as much as possible. Get in touch with the locals. Any any lead, you know, any information that could help to uh, that would lead to the recovery of the remains of the missing in action, American missing in action here in our area. So that's it, guys. Uh, it was an honor uh, to be with you and to share our experience here from the town of Bamban. Uh, uh, and here's our uh, website and my YouTube channel. And this and that's my address details. So, Paul, that that is the you know the conclusion of my uh, talk for today with you. Well, it's been absolutely fascinating. And we have a couple more questions. I mean, you know, the, the, one of the things yep. that's been coming up there is about the, um, you know, you're recovering, potentially recovering war dead, you're recovering relics, you're investigating sites of, of, of death. Obviously, this is all done. You have to, you know, record things. You're in touch with the authorities. You can't just go out in, with a shovel into the hills and start looking for stuff. So so that that must take a lot of your time, just consulting with organizations oh, yeah. and doing the paperwork. Yeah. Really? Really, it takes a lot of courage, you know. I'm just a simple guy, but we have this a heavy task. But you know, uh, we we feel that what we're doing is very important. That we should do it uh, in the hope that uh, you know there will be more Filipinos to follow our steps and do these things also in their in their places. You know, uh, for the sake of uh, uh, preservation of World War II history, because uh, as I've been telling, um, yeah. my grandfathers and my uncles were part of that history. So it's very important for us. Yeah. Yes. Uh, sometimes we have this uh, main problem is the you know financial problem. Of course, you cannot do this that uh, that easy. But fortunately, we have some friends. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, Gerard Randy Anderson, uh, Tim Beckinsale. Uh, yeah, uh, so, some of uh, these these guys are really amazing mm. persons. Uh, um, and in fact, uh, if I post on my Facebook page that says, uh, "Guys, uh, we have we have a mission to open a tunnel on Hill 500. Uh, would you like to join us?" And you could see 
it's not the Filipinos that who will be joining me, but you know, <laughs> other nationalities. <laughs> Well, and, and, and eventually, if you do get a book out, I mean, a book can help raise funds as well. And, you know, and there's people watching this who will who have been in thoroughly yep, impressed yep. by your knowledge. Yep. They've been impressed by the museum. So uh, I can see a little bit of help coming from World War II TV. We've got a couple more questions for you to things. So so Lorelai is asking, when you hear about these new new tunnels near where you are, how do you find out about them? Is it just kind of local people saying, I've always heard there's a rumor, there's a tunnel in my back garden? Or do you use more sophisticated methods like with ground penetrating radar? Is it just kind of word of mouth? We use the old the old method, you know. Um, OK, the locals are very important. Uh, you know, Japanese tunnels are constructed in a very distinctive way. Right. You could see on the slope, there is some sort of a, a cut like this leading to the opening of the tunnel. And and you could see the the debris, the, for, the foreign debris on the entrance of the tunnel. And that would give you an idea that this is really a tunnel. And yeah, the locals would, would give us uh, uh, also information uh, way back in the 60s, 70s, that there was a small opening like that, that they believe that it's a tunnel. That's another, that's another um, important lead. And we also have this uh, photographic analysis. Um, very, uh, uh, there, 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 are, there are several photographs, you know, taken in Bon Bon Hills, just near the museum. Uh, you could see them on both sides, how the U.S. Army bombarded the face of the ridge line. Mm. But if you go there, there are no tunnels. But since we are from this place, we grew up here. We knew every inch of this place by just comparing that uh, uh, photograph. And you go to the exact place, you could see, oh, this silt tunnel is somewhat here. It's a detective work that all of us who study battlefields do all the time. I do it in Normandy. Other people watching it do it in their battlefields. So, um, Fantastic. So one last question for you. And, you know, you talked about the important relationship you had with the U.S. because, you know, you shared the, the job of liberating the Philippines, but you also work with Japanese tourists. So so Vlad is asking, what are the reactions of Japanese tourists when they see the tunnels uh, and well, when they see the artifacts? They are really thankful to us, you know, because we're doing this, uh, um, uh, trying to, you know, uh, put up the history of... Uh, of this town into the perspective of the Japanese because a lot of a lot of uh, Japanese died inside these tunnels that there is always a possibility of uh, uh, remains of the war dead that we could get from these tunnels. Yeah, they appreciate because uh, when they come here in my museum, they could see a lot of exhibit about the tunnels and I told them about our operation fireflies, our project discovery tunnels and they, they, they appreciate it. Thank you. Well, my last thing is the people watching this, and it's not just people watching it live today, there'll be people watching it over the next few hours and days, is other than getting in contact with you, following you on your Facebook page, going to your yep. YouTube channel, what what else can do people do to help the museum? Well, you know, just right now, we're, we're undertaking a major repairs because of the roof. Uh, it was old and, you know, a simple guy. And to make a museum is something out of this world you know mm. museums are being built by 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 solid institutions government yes. or private not just an ordinary guy but uh, it is just uh, a matter of doing it to the best of what we have sometimes we don't have what we have is the strength of heart to build this and yeah uh, they could get in touch with me if they would like to contribute to my museum if they would like to help uh, recently, we've been we've been experiencing massive uh, uh, monsoon rains that dump a lot of water into my exhibit hall. Oh dear! So yeah, so I decided to, you know, uh, approach my friends, and some of them, yes, Ronnie, we will help you, and that's the reason why I was able to, you know, in my at my back is a new roof, yeah, that would save this precious artifacts so that Filipinos, generations of Filipinos will never forget that there was indeed the war of my grandfathers and my uncles, that every Filipino family has a blood 
of World War II heroes. That's the most important thing. And of course, those Americans who died here, those Americans who fought here, we will we'll never forget these guys, you know, and to preserve World War II history about more than 30,000 Japanese died here. You know, many of these were never came back in their home in Japan. Bonbon bon bon battlefields became an open graveyard. Mm. That's one reason that, that the Japanese come here also. And okay. yes, they, they, they do appreciate what we're doing. Yeah, so well, I think that's it. Uh, and well, the most important you. thing, I'm we're sorry. happy what we are doing here. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, that's Kung Fu, yeah. your passion, your determination, your enthusiasm for the subject. I mean, I have a lot of different guests on World War II TV, and some are very professional historians or they teach history and, and they're still passionate about it, but they're still in yep. knowledgeable. But you're, you're, you've been the most enthusiastic guest I've had for some time. You can tell this isn't just work for you. This is your Thank life. You. It's your it's your passion. It's your it's your everything. So on behalf of all the World War II TV viewers and now and in the future, thank you very much for your work. I can't wait to invite you back on again. Thank Folks, you, Paul. Tomorrow, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, on, sure, and yeah. um, we'll we'll leave it there. So, thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, viewers. This is Paul Woodhouse from World War Two TV saying, "I'll see you all again tomorrow." Thank for you, Paul. Thank you Cheers. to our viewers. Yep. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.